Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Marin software stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Marin Software is an online advertising company. It provides marketing software to integrate and improve a company's digital advertising budget across web and mobile devices. It helps businesses get new customers, improve financial performance, and make better decisions. The company is headquartered in San Francisco, California and was founded in 2006. It also has offices in Austin, Texas, Dublin, London, New York, Paris, and Shanghai. It went public in 2013 and trades on the Nasdaq, Deutsche Börse, and Börse Stuttgart. I've seen other YouTubers call this company Marin. It's not called Marin, it's Marin. I actually live in Marin County, the same place the founders live and the same place they started the company, which is why they call it Marin Software. Christopher Lean came up with the concept when he realized that search advertisers had no viable software for managing their online campaigns, especially large advertisers. In 2007, Marin Search Marketer made its debut and became commercially available in North America, signing Razorfish and Zip Realty. It became Marin One and is intended for easy and efficient management of large-scale online advertising programs across search, social, and e-commerce. In 2013, it raised $105 million through an IPO. Its valuation was $425 million at the time. Currently, its market cap is half that, even though the stock went up over 1,000% the past week and a half. It is the highest trending stock ticker the past two weeks. Message boards are aggressively trying to apply a short squeeze. On June 23rd, it was under $2 a share, and a few days later, it was trading at over $25 at one point. I've seen some articles mentioning the short interest is above 200%. In theory, the short interest can go to affinity, because one share can be borrowed and sold over and over and over again. There are only 11 million shares outstanding, which makes it easier for retail investors to buy and hold all the shares. Short sellers will be forced to buy the stock to cover their short position at some point. Retail investors can buy up all the shares and hold and try not to sell to the short sellers. The short sellers will have to keep bidding higher and higher until someone sells their shares so the short seller can cover their position. Even though the idea is not to sell, we all know everyone has their price. So let's do a simple example. If you own half the shares of the company and I own half the shares of the company, then the short seller will ask me to sell the stock to them for $30. And if I say no, he'll ask you to sell it for $40. They'll keep going back and forth, raising their price until one of us sells our shares. In this scenario, one of us will get rich and the other person will lose money. Because once one of us sells our shares, the stock price will probably tank. The company recently announced that its ad management platform now lets users manage Instacart ads, which may have helped push the stock price higher. Let's get started with the model. This is a micro cap company, 223 million market cap. They're trading at $20 a share and they have 11 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video, and free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have negative free cash flow each year, their revenue isn't high, and they haven't hit break even yet. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement, it's revenue minus expenses, that's also negative every year. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that decreases each year from 59 million to 28 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And their gross profit decreases each year. Below that is operating expenses. And their operating expenses are higher than their gross profit. So they have negative operating income each year. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which of course is negative every year. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. 
And then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they have negative free cash flow each year, so they need money from somewhere to fund their operations. They issued 1.6 million of capital stock in 2019, 7.7 .7 million in 2020, and almost 11 million in the trailing 12 months. Every time a company issues capital stock, that increases the shares outstanding, making your shares less valuable. So it dilutes you, the shareholder, every time they issue new shares. But they need money so they don't go bankrupt. They also issued $3 million of debt in 2020, but it looks like they paid down about that amount in the past few years. This is the equity section of the company's balance sheet. Additional paid in capital is how much money the company generated from selling shares of stock from their IPO and all the capital raises after the IPO. So they received a little over $300 million from issuing stock. Retain earnings is all the company's prior net incomes. So you can see they lost almost $300 million since operating their business. That's not a good sign. You want to see positive retain earnings. If the retain earnings became worse than negative $311 million, then the company is likely headed towards bankruptcy. And they're getting pretty close, so they're in really bad shape. Let's look at the capital structure. 17 million of equity, 10 million of debt. They're 64% equity, 36% debt. Their net debt is negative 5 million, so they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have 5 million of cash left over. And their weighted average cost of capital, which is a blend of the cost of equity and cost of debt, is over 10%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. The sum of these numbers equals the present value of the future free cash flows. But since it's negative, I just use the equity value on their balance sheet. The equity is the assets minus liabilities on a balance sheet. That's the value of the company if they file bankruptcy. So if they sold off all their assets, then use the cash from the sale of their assets to pay off all their liabilities, they would have $17 million of cash left over. Because I can't see them at any point generating positive free cash flow. We take that $17 million and divide by 11 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $1.53. And that's pretty close to what they were trading at before the big pump a couple weeks ago. Now they're trading at over $20 a share, so they're extremely overvalued. Here's a chart of the stock price since it started trading. So it looks like it was trading at over $110 a share when it first IPO'd, but it was never this high. They did a one for seven reverse stock split in 2017. So all the numbers before October 2017, you have to divide by seven to figure out the actual stock price on that day. So it looks like about 110 a share. So you can divide that by seven. So they probably IPO'd around $16 a share. But then the stock price got below $1 and they didn't want to get delisted so they did a 1 for 7 reverse stock split. A reverse stock split is a sign of a company in distress. It's generally not a good thing. Companies don't want to get delisted because if they start trading over the counter there's less visibility and less people buying the stock. This is where the stock has been trading the last 12 months. So you can see there was a bump up here and there was a lot of activity. And then it was pretty flat for a while. Then the big pump. You can see all the activity so much more than before. And this stock has a negative beta so it moves opposite the market. Because the stock has been so volatile lately, the stock has gone up over 1000% in the past 52 weeks. While the S&P 500 went up 36%. The 52 week low was $1.14 and the high was close to $26. The stock is trading way above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. This is a really liquid stock. 145 million shares are traded on average the past 10 days. Of the 11 million shares outstanding, 10 million are on float. That's a really small amount of shares outstanding. Part of the reason is they did that one for seven reverse stock split. So they had 77 million shares before the split. Now they have 11 million. Sometimes companies do a reverse stock split so it decreases the shares outstanding because they want to go private. But that's a pretty rare case. That wasn't the case in this situation. They just did the reverse stock split so they wouldn't get delisted. But only 10 million shares outstanding and when it was trading under $2 a share, you could have bought a lot of shares. 
Some companies have over 1 billion shares outstanding, so it's really hard to make an impact on a short squeeze. So I guess it's a lot easier to do a short squeeze with lower shares outstanding. I really never thought about that before, but it makes sense. 21% of the shares are held by institutions and 1.5% of the shares are shorted. This is probably an error in Yahoo Finance because a lot more shares are shorted. So the stock is up 1000% in the past 52 weeks. In the past three years, it's up 169%. But even with the big pump recently, the stock is still down the past five years. So you can see how much this stock has really struggled up 1000% and it's still down in the past five years. Their annual earnings have increased 9% in the past five years, but they're negative, so that's not good. Their industry is up 25%, the market 12%. Their earnings decreased 4% the past year, while its industry is up a lot and the market is up 22%. If you invested $10,000 when this company IPO'd, you'd be down to $1,300 today. That's an 87% loss. This is with the recent pump. Two weeks ago, you would have been down to 200 bucks. Your investment would have been down 98%. The biggest shareholder is Benchmark at 5%, then DAG Ventures, Renaissance Technologies. The founder and CEO owns 2.35% of the stock. His value is now $4 million. Just two weeks ago, his value was only $400,000. And then Sapphire owns 1.8% of the stock. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE because they have negative net income. They have a decent price to sales ratio of 8.1. That's better than a market average. But of course, they're not converting any of that revenue into profit. They have negative earnings every year. Their price to book is a bit high at 13.2. But two weeks ago, these ratios looked really good because their stock price was a lot lower. Because stock price is a numerator of the price to sales and price to book ratio. And their current ratio is 1.7. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. So they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. And they have 15 million of cash on their balance sheet from their recent capital raise. So it looks like they do have enough funding to get through the next 12 months without issuing more stock or taking on more debt. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 30 companies in the same industry as Marin. And we can't look at Marin's PE ratio. They're doing much better in price to sales and price to book. They have a good current ratio. They have a bad ROE. They're a little higher in debt than average. And they're a really small company, 223 million market cap. To summarize, I have them trading at a significant premium, but no one really knows where the top is. The stock price can go up to $100 a share. So if you got in now, you can make 5X, but it's really risky, of course. I've never invested in these pump and dumps because I never know when to sell because I generally like to buy and hold. So it's really hard to tell the best entry and exit point. Even if you tripled your money, you may not sell because at one point you could have been 5x. So you don't want to sell because you're not as high as you once were. So you keep waiting. A lot of people don't make money with these stocks. They hold too long. But I have to admit it is fun seeing the retail investor try to stick it to Wall Street. I was thinking about buying options next time to the short squeeze. If I do, I'll let you know. I rank their free cash flows 2 out of 10, their revenue 2 out of 10, and their ratio 3 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.